Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we've got one Cambodian here, so to that one Cambodian, I'll, I'll say Sul Sadei, okay? <laughs> um, and to all the Aussies, g'day, how are you going? Okay. Um, I'm the daughter of a, an Australian milkman, and I'm very proud of my blue-collar upbringing. In my early 20s, I found out that I could never have children, so I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, hoping to have a life of glamour and travel, and I envisaged flying around the world, working in embassies and wearing black cocktail dresses and getting seduced by James Bond types. But <laughs> it turned out that my first posting was in Phnom Penh just days after uh, the Vietnam War reached the country, so it was anything uh, that I was expecting. Um, but Cambodia, from in the 70s, it just stole my heart. It was a very tragic country then, and it's still a tragic country, but uh, it's just captured my heart. Um, and in, uh, during that time, uh, with Foreign Affairs, I worked for ambassadors and diplomats. After Cambodia, I went to the Philippines, had five years there. Um, then I had three years in Bangkok, three years in Iran, also during the Iran-Iraq war. I think Canberra must have thought she likes war zones, so we'll send her to them. Um, and then I went to Washington, D.C. for three years, and that was the most dangerous of all my postings, I have to tell you. Living in Washington is um, a bit scary. Um, my spirituality is a mixture of a Jewish heritage, being educated in a Christian environment, living in an Islamic country, and finally finding contentment, understanding in Buddhism. So I figure when I get to the pearly gates, I'm all covered and I'll be let in. Um, now, please remember that your health is your wealth. What's the point of getting to a great place in your career if you get sick doing it? Why be the best businessman in the hospital ward? Why be the richest person in the cemetery? I often think of Steve Jobs, who died of cancer, and if anybody had enough money um, to pay for a cure, it was him. So um, your health is your wealth. Um, my five-year battle with breast cancer was something I was totally unprepared for. Um, I've always been as healthy as an oxo. In 2009, when I had a double mastectomy, it was a bit of a shock. It did take a toll on my health, but um, I've been two-year cancer-free and looking forward to a healthy... <laughs> I have to be well because I have so much more to do. Um, Cambodia gives me all the mystery I could ever want. Every day I know I will cry, get angry, laugh, get frustrated, be amazed, confused, and also thankful. One thing I often say to myself is never delay joy. And I work hard to live up to this every, every day. You can find joy in every day if you're looking for it. And I say to people who ask me why things aren't going right for them, I say to them, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not, then it's not yet the end. So, you know, it's a very um, good thing to be optimistic in your everyday life. We see on television and through the print media the things that we should have and own, and it's difficult to ignore this. My kids um, now have access to YouTube and the internet, and they see all, all the material things um, that I wish they didn't see because they're never going to be able to have them. Um, and for 18 years I lived a privileged life working in Australian embassies around the world and then for Chase Manhattan Bank for eight years before I came to Cambodia. But I distinguished myself most in Iran where I managed all by myself to marry the only alcoholic Shiite Muslim in existence. <laughs> so I apologise to the Muslims here today, it was just bad judgement on my, on my part. Um, I enjoyed first-class travel, elegant apartments, maids, security guards, chauffeur-driven cars to work. The social work in, the, in the, the political part of the embassy was fascinating. I mixed with diplomats and high government officials. It was all very exciting. Um, I lived life to the fullest and then some. In 1987, I uh, resigned from the public service. I was a bit jaded by the political life, and that's when I went um, to Sydney and worked for Chase Manhattan Bank. Um, and when I lived and worked in Sydney, I never gave to any charity of any kind. If you're a Sydneyite, you'll know that every Friday, the Salvation Army goes down uh, to meet the ferries when they come in to go to work. 
And for eight years, I walked around the men with the collection tin because nobody was getting my 50 cents. Everything was for moi. Everything was for me. Um, so uh, I was bored in my job, and eventually my boredom uh, was pretty evident from the quality of my work, and I got fired uh, in 1995, um, a week before my 50th birthday. And um, I had not prepared for anything like that. Um, I lived from paycheck to paycheck, which was, you know, I could do very well on that. And there I was in 1995, uh, fired 50, um, and another F that I won't say here today. Um, and I thought, what am I going to do? I don't want to go on the streets of Sydney at the age of 50 trying to compete with lovely blonde 25, 30-year-olds for a job. So um, it was the universe telling me it's time for change. So I remembered that the um, new prime minister in Cambodia was Prince Norodom Runarid, who was the son of King Sihanouk. And he'd just been voted in uh, under the UN elections in 1993. And when I was there in the 70s, this is how, how coincidences in life can really work for you. In the 70s, he and his wife, Princess Marie, were the landlords for my embassy apartment. So I used to go every month and give the prince and the princess the, the, the monthly rent. And I'd say, oh, look here, um, Prince, my toilet's broken down. Can you get somebody around to fix it? You know? So I won't say we were close friends, but we had a relationship. So uh, when I was trying to decide what to do with my life, I rang him up and I said, look, you remember me, I was your tenant. Um, I've, I'm now 50, but I've got a lot to offer. Is there something you can give me? So um, he offered me a job in his small cabinet. And um, Einstein said that coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous. And there I answered his English correspondence, I wrote some speeches for him, and I completed their security and protocol manuals. And on the weekends, I spent time at his wife's orphanage being with the children that were destined to become my life. Let me share with you some of the things I value in my life as wealth and abundance. Many of these notions of wealth and abundance will resonate with you. But most of us, most of us take these riches for granted. Having the unconditional love of a child, never having experienced hunger, being born in a country that has never had a war fought on its territory or been occupied by a foreign power. Being able to criticise politicians privately and publicly without fear of arrest or assassination. Knowing that a fireman will arrive to fight your fire in your house without ha having to pay them cash first in advance, as happens in Cambodia. Being born in a country that has a reliable, experienced and trained ambulance staff um, in Cambodia, the ambulance drivers moonlight, and you'll see them in the, uh, during the day delivering beer to bars. So if you, if you need an ambulance, you've probably got to book your accident in advance um, to get one to turn up. Knowing that your political elections are free and fair and not plagued with corruption. Surviving breast cancer. Being able to travel knowing I'm raising money for Sunrise Cambodia at the same time. Enjoying the creative pleasure of writing. I'm writing my, my second book now. Knowing that I'm fulfilling my destiny. So many people go through their whole lives and they never really get to do what it is they're here for. Waking up in the morning and loving everything that I have to do that day. Uh, I don't know when it's a weekend and um, a, a working day because when you're a mother, you don't say to your kids on Friday night, look, you know, it's the weekend, I'll see you on Monday. You know, they're, they're there all the time. And most of all, eventually realising that stuff does not make you happy. I hate all the stuff you could possibly imagine. A mink coat, jewellery, first class travel, catered for dinner parties. But I'd go to bed at night after, you know, a day of materialism, and I'd lie in bed and I'd think, is, is that it? Is that all there is? So do know that, you know, I loved my stuff and I've still got my stuff, but it doesn't really make you happy. Our lives are determined first by the country we're born in. If you were born in the West, your life's pretty much going to be okay. But if you were born in rural Cambodia or the backwoods of Bangladesh, you can be reasonably sure that your life will suck. Cambodia, it's a very different world. 
and to remind you of why everything is in such tatters, let me give you a thumbnail history of the country. Before 1902, the, when the country was a French protectorate, Cambodia was an almost unknown, peaceful, rice-growing rural paradise. Under French administration, the people had little power over their day-to-day -day lives until King Sihanouk negotiated independence from the French in the mid-50s. It was to be a new beginning, but Cambodians were given, given very little time to make a success of nationhood. The French had installed a perfectly good system of education based on the French system, which basically fell apart with the start of the Vietnam War in 1970. Not many people know this, but more bombs were dropped in Cambodia than in Japan during World War II, when under the rural carpet bombing inspired by Nixon and, and Kissinger. More than one million innocent people, these are farmers and villagers, not, not related to the war or soldiers. So on top of the two million that were killed, there are a million of innocent people that were killed by the carpet bombs. Um, and from 1970 to the early 90s, the education system was in a complete shambles. All the universities stopped during the war. And the next step backwards in Cambodia's tragic history was in 1975, when the infamous Khmer Rouge, under the leadership of Pol Pot, took over the country with disastrous impact on almost every aspect of human and Cambodian society. In just four years, from 75 to 79, Listen to this. Anyone who had attended a school over the age of seven and who wore glasses were put to death just because it was known that they could read and were educated. Teachers, doctors, architects, engineers, lawyers, journalists, artists, public servants, everyone that they could find that were pillars of society or who worked as a professional were assassinated or put in labour camps where they died of starvation or hard labour. All money was burnt. The family unit was destroyed and husbands, wives and children were separated and put to work in labour camps and una unable to ever see each other. Pagodas were burnt. Monks were murdered. Religion was abolished. Libraries, all books and even the register of births, deaths and marriages were destroyed. People were reduced to an animal-like level, often with farm animals being fed more food and treated better than people. Out of a population of 7 million in 1975, an estimated of 2 million were killed through assassination, starvation, torture or hard labour. Never in recorded history had a population of people been so completely decimated and destroyed by their own people and a new word was entered into the dictionary, auto-genocide. Every day in modern Phnom Penh, there is virtually no person who did not lose a close family member during these horrendous times, or if they survived, are living with memories so tormenting that many of them cannot function normally. Um, they suffer from depression, um, hypertension, they suffer from guilt complexes because they survived. And it's not an exaggeration to say that all the survivors of the killing fields are suffering from these post-traumatic stress disorders, which are not being treated because there are no psychiatrists or psychologists in Cambodia. They were all murdered. Then in late 79, the Vietnamese, the North Communist Vietnamese, not the South, who fought and lost the war against communism, liberated the Cambodians by ousting Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge from the country. This was fabulous, but the downside of that was that um, the terror was not over for the Cambodians because the North Viet Vietnamese occupied the country for 13 years and introduced communism, which was the very thing the Cambodians fought against in the 70s. Um, the Vietnamese, to be fair, recognised the need for people to be more educated, but because there was no one left alive in the country to do that, they shipped these considered to be capable to other communist countries like China, the USSR, Poland and Czechoslovakia where they learned communist ways as well as getting a good education. And slowly the deserted schools and universities began to awaken and take in students. But it wasn't until the United Nations arrived in 1993 to supervise the first free and fair election 
that the education system was free to try and organise itself from the ashes. It is sad um, to know that um, out of all the universities um, open in Cambodia, not one of them, um, if you get a degree from there, is recognised in another country. Um, the UN sponsored the first free and fair elections, uh, but they didn't um, on these recent elections, which um, just happened uh, a few days ago. Uh, I voted and I've got my stamp to prove it. Um, so, so we're in the, in the hands of, um, of, of the previous government. But with the terrors of the Pol Pot days still ringing in their heads, the people were afraid to embrace education. It was a death sentence. What they had learned was that it was dangerous to be intelligent. And even some of the kids at Sunrise, they hear the stories from their parents and their grandparents and their communities that it's dangerous to let people know you're clever. So whereas in your schools, and um, the teacher asks a question and everybody's going like that, oh, ask me, I know, I know. But in Cambodia, no one puts their hand up because they don't want to be noticed as, as being um, intelligent. Um, just think about this for a minute. In some of the schools I go to, with 2,000 students, there will be two toilets with no water to wash your hands. Think about that for a moment, going to school and not um, having access to a toilet. Um, and that's uh, the main reason why a lot of girls stop going to school, because when they start to menstruate, there's nowhere for them to go, um, so they drop out of school altogether. Um, Cambodia has to make huge steps forward in the system of education before it can truly come out of the mist. In the schools, there's no electricity, so there's no computers, no fans, no air conditioning, no canteens, no playing fields, no extracurricular activities, no substitute teachers if a teacher is sick, and not enough books for everyone. They have to share their books. And any misbehaviour is punished with a firm swish of a long bamboo cane. Um, we don't allow any kind of uh, capital punishment um, at my centres, but they go to the schools and get beaten all the time if they misbehave. And if you believe in reincarnation, you would definitely hope that you did not come back as a child in current day Cambodia. If education is a measure of wealth, then Cambodia is one of the poorest nation on earth. A good education for primary age children even for those who, who have families who can afford to pay, is seriously limited. The salaries for teachers is as low as 120 US dollars a month, which does not encourage people to want to study teaching and education at the local universities, because the salaries are so low. Most teachers work two jobs simply to survive. School is only three hours a day at all levels. Most children grow up in an environment of a in, impover, impoverishment in every sense of the word. And for many of them, school is just a dream. At Sunrise Cambodia, we care for many abandoned children and babies from local hospitals. Parents of six children often have to sell a cow to come into town to get their kids to a hospital. And when they're at the free hospital, one of two things happen. The doctors either say, well, look, your kid's sick, but he's fine now, but I can't guarantee that he or she won't get sick again. And so the mum and dad think about this and they say, look, if we take the kids home and they get sick again, we can't afford to sell another cow. So they leave the kid in the hospital hoping that somebody like Sunrise will come along and give them a better life. It's not that they don't love their children, they can't care for them. And the second thing that happens is the doctors will say, well, look, your, your child's really ill and is going to die in a few months and the Cambodians can't afford $6 for a cremation. So they leave the kids in the hospital again, hoping that we will come along and, and take the child. And we've done this many times, and sometimes the children only last for a few months, but at least they have a dignified Buddhist funeral, which is something that their parents could never give them. These parents simply have no other choice, and it must be heartbreaking for them to, to make these choices. Um, our response has been to provide residential care for highly vulnerable children with HIV AIDS, TB, polio, hepatitis B, brittle bone disease, varying degrees of cerebral palsy, 
mental and emotional conditions and a, a disease called acquired aplastic anemia, which is a blood cancer caused only by the spraying of Agent Orange by the Americans in the countryside. So it's a blood cancer caused through the war and through the American um, spraying. Now, Cambodia can be a dangerous, depressing, dirty and difficult country to work and live in. But I will never leave this magical country and people, um, they make me know I'm truly alive. Anyway, Lai Tai, he came to us when he was nine. His mother had sold him uh, to a begging ring in Thailand because he's crippled. He has cerebral palsy and is very badly deformed in his legs. And they thought he would make a really good beggar. Perfectly normal, intelligent kid, but he was sold as a beggar. Now, the International Office of Migration um, helps take children that have been arrested for being in the country illegally, and they take them from the um, jails, and they bring them to Cambodia to the border and put them in camps, and then eventually these children are sent to places like Sunrise. So that's how Lai Tai came to us. Um, and when he came to us, he just captured everybody's love. He's just a beautiful kid, big black eyes, and um, every year I do um, profile reports to the sponsors who sponsor the children. And it's boring, you know, I write and say, this is, this is Tommy, his favourite colour is pink, he likes fish, his best friend is Tom and he wants to be a doctor. How boring. So I decided um, that I would ask the kids a very important question. So I asked all the kids, if you had half an hour with Buddha, what would you ask him for? So I asked the kids, um, about this, what they wanted, and the boys were saying motorbikes and cameras and computers, and the, the girls were saying jewellery, a lovely house, rich husbands, you know, all the things you expect kids to ask for. And then I got to little Lai Tai and I said, darling, what, what, what would you ask Buddha for? And he said, oh, mummy, he said, Buddha's so important and busy, I wouldn't want to waste his time, I don't need anything, I'm okay. And I said, well, you've got to tell me something that you want, because I've got to tell your sponsor. So what do you want? And he thought about it and he looked up and he finally said, well, Mum, what I really want is for Buddha to make me a really good person in this life because I must have done something very bad in my previous life for my mother to throw me away and for me not to walk like other children. And he said, but if Buddha makes me a good person in this life, Maybe in my next life I'll grow up and I'll have a mother who loves me and I'll be able to run like the other children. So that's Lai Tai's story. He's now 14 and he's working as a chef in a restaurant and has got a good future. Uh, then, other terrible things that happen in Cambodia that I know you, some of my friends told me, Jordan, you make these stories up and I'm sorry, you don't have to make stories up in Cambodia. I was in a, a, a bar one night waiting for my friends to join me for dinner and there was a couple of Americans down at the end of the bar and they were very upset and they were thumping the table and they, they just were really upset. And I went up to them and I said, look, no, I live here, if you've got a problem, maybe I can help you. And they said, no, we don't, we don't have a problem. They said, we're Rotarians from America and we're here building wells for villages. And they said, just before we came into uh, the bar, a man came up to us with a big folder of laminated pictures of disabled children, limbless, blind, mentally retarded, landmine victims, and they said, you want sex with one of these kids? You let us know, we can arrange it. And I thought, what has the world come to where there are people, men out there who would want to have sex with a disabled child whose lives are already miserable? And I just uh, couldn't believe it. Um, I couldn't eat my dinner that night and I went home and the next day I went to the Ministry of Interior where I've got a, a friend there, she's a woman, and uh, she's a colonel and she heads up the uh, human trafficking part of um, the ministry. And I, I went to her big, tough, leather, leathery skinned woman with breasts down to here and she wears a tight uniform and she's scary. And I, I said to her, look, I've just found out about this having sex with disabled children down at the riverfront. Can you please send some of your, you know, your private clothes police down there and arrest these people? And one big tear fell down this hard woman's face and she said, Geraldine, we know all about it but we can't do anything because the police are getting their cut. And so these are times when I have to say to myself, Geraldine, you can't worry and waste your precious time and energy 
worrying about things you cannot change. You can change the lives of the children that come into your life, but you, you can't change the big picture. So it's sad, and I know it's not happening in any other country that you live in. And then the final story, again, people say I make it up. Uh, when I'm uh, flying home to Australia to fundraise money, I go to the local markets and I buy silk and knickknacks and um, gadgets and things to take back to sell at fundraising events. And I'm well known at the market. They call me Big Mum at the market. And my silk lady said to me when I was in there buying stuff, she said, um, oh, Geraldine, she said, there's a little boy that's just been abandoned on a noodle store. We call him Noodles. Do you want to go and have a look at him? So I went along to the noodle stall. The husband and wife were running it. And there was this beautiful baby, about eight months old, healthy, quite fat, um, big, lovely brown eyes. And I looked down at him and I said, I can't take you today. I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Australia. But when I come back in three weeks, I'll come and get you. I went to Australia, rose, raised some money, came back. I was back about a week and I thought, oh, I better go and get noodles. And I went to the market and if you could imagine how I felt when I looked into his face to find that his eyes had been harvested, harvested and sold on the black market um, to people for their um, corneas. So many good stories. I've, I've told you the worst, now I'm going to tell you the best. Um, over the years, I've been fortunate to secure scholarships for some students to study in Australia, and they've now returned to Cambodia, highly qualified with degrees in nursing, media, communications, hotel management and hospitality, and they're all now living and working in Cambodia, striving to make it a better place. I have young people now in Cambodia studying medicine, law, civil engineering, architecture, uh, English literature, social affairs, international relations, management, banking, IT and hospitality. And they are just, the, I know I'm doing something right when I see them at university. Um, I've got a qualified lawyer, I won't have to pay legal fees for the rest of my life. Um, I've got, got a banker, a um, qualified banker who's working at um, ANZ Bank and my uh, a grad girl has just graduated from um, an international relations degree just a couple of months ago. So um, I've also had students get scholarships in Israel um, to study agriculture. And last year, uh, one of my brightest boys was accepted among hundreds of applicants to be the Cambodian representative at the UN um, workshops on the environment in Cambodia. So. Now, we also provide vocational training for those that are less academically inclined. And so we did that. He did six months in the vocational training course. And when he'd finished and was in the workforce for a couple of months, I rang him up and I said, oh, let's meet, have lunch, tell me what you're doing. So we had lunch and I said, well, what are you doing? And he said, oh, mum, he said, I work for the biggest movie company in the country. I travel all over the place to um, uh, sites to, to, to film movies. I have free food, free accommodation, and I do the hair and the nails of the most beautiful actresses in Cambodia. And then he leaned forward and he said, he's getting $800 a month, which is huge in Cambodia. He leaned forward and he said, I didn't need maths or biology for that. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very proud of him. Um, Cambodians are now accessing the internet, and the older children often talk to me about what they see and hear. And it's an uphill job assuring and reassuring them of a good future when they are constantly being reminded on the international news of man-made mayhem, murder, misery, violence, sexual deviance, crime, drugs, disease, terrorism, war, economic crisis, political disturbance, torture, corruption, cruelty, religious intolerance, racism, homophobia, and Mother Nature's way of saying she's very unhappy with us, with famines, global warming, earthquakes, typhoons, 
floods and fires, all of which was on the news just this morning. And it is easy to believe that God has left the building a long time ago. And looking out at your young and eager faces gives me hope for the world and mankind. And if I have any message for you, it is to find your passion and joy in life and to embrace it. Living without your passion is really only being half alive. And you don't have to run off to the jungles of Cambodia and find your purpose in life. It can be in bringing up a healthy and loving family. It can be in service to the community. It can be in the corporate world, closing big business deals. It can be in the world of academia. It can be in music or the arts. It can be through research. It can be through sport. It can be through medicine and healing. It can be in politics. And it can even be in your religion. But find your passion. Maybe in this room, are people who will find cures for cancer, AIDS and other illnesses. Maybe in this room are people who will find ways to clean our rivers and our seas. Maybe in this room are people who can heal the earth and make Mother Nature start to forgive us for what we have done to her. My generation could not do it. You have to. But please find that button to press that makes you know you're alive. All of you are here today to learn how to make the world a better place. A man who has done more than any of us can dream to achieve, put it so simply. Nelson Mandela said in his 1994 inaugural speech in Africa, he said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who are we to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God and your playing small does not serve the world. He added, there is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that others won't feel insecure around you. It's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Great, great quotes. Um, let me share um, one story of, of a girl that wasn't afraid to shine. Her name, and I'm not going to fall over this time, she lived in a big house um, controlled by a, a, a begging ring and she was given food, uh, but they were not kept clean and every day the bus would take them out and put them off in their little begging areas in Patia with their mug. And um, after, we, we're not sure of the time frame, but after a while she was told she was not getting enough money, so they held her down and and threw battery acid over her. She's lost an eye and an ear, and she has horrible facial and upper body acid burns. And she's a monster to look at. Um, eventually, they took her back. Next day, put her out on the streets with all her burns, no, no medical care, nothing. And after, again, an, an un unknown amount of time, she obviously wasn't bringing in enough money for the beggars, um, so one day they just didn't pick her up. She was only like eight or nine and she didn't know how to get home because the, the truck used to pick them up. So she was there for two or three days in a shocking condition until the Austrian consulate found her on the streets and he picked her up and he took her to the hospital and had her burns treated and he eventually put her in a, a Thai orphanage. And then after a while the Thais realised that she wasn't a Thai because she was speaking Thai with a Cambodian accent. So the Thai said, oh, look, you're not a Thai. Um, and so they put her in the immigration prison. And what happened in there, I don't even want to tell you about. I'll just leave it to your imagination. Um, and then when the Austrian consul went to check up on her, he saw that she was in the prison and, and only imagined what was happening to her. So he took her out, gave her to the of Office of International Migration, who sent her up to the border. And then I went up to the border and picked her up and brought her to us. Um, she was 10. All this had happened to her before she was 10 years old. 
Um, we couldn't send her to the school because her injuries were so horrific they would have just treated her badly at the school. So we hired a, um, a, 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 a private school teacher to come to Sunrise and tutor her. And in one year, she went to learning Cambodian again. And by the time the year was over, we took her to the school and she was assessed at grade three level. So she started grade three at the age of 11. Um, she's now progressed and the intelligence in this one eye that shines out to you, you know this girl is gonna make it. Um, she passed grade 12, flying colors. Um, she's doing an international relations degree at the university. And last year, she was invited to speak at the International Bern Conference in Geneva. And she addressed um, the conference in English to a standing ovation. Um, nothing is gonna stop this girl. Um, and then when she left us to go to university and live in town and, and she was no longer under the sunrise umbrella, um, I know life was tough for her on the streets, uh, doing her shopping and everything and mixing with normal people. And I said to her one day, I said, well, I said, how do you cope when people call you ugly and a monster and all of that? And she said, oh, mum, she said, I just stand up very tall and I turn to them and I say, what I look like is not who I am. And don't you just love wow? Um, she's gonna make me proud. Um, I know, know she's gonna have a happy and successful and independent life. And if she's the only child that Sunrise has helped, then um, I've done my job. So that's wow. You are about to decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. Some of you may already know what you want to be. Many will not. Trust your teachers and counsellors and be guided by their advice. But listen to your heart and what it tells you. It knows you better than anybody else. I'm known in um, Australia by some people to be that red-haired woman in Cambodia with the silly hairstyle and I'm often described as being loud, aggressive, and pushy. I actually see these as my attributes. Um, if people do not know who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and how to raise money for us, then we would never survive uh, as a charity. So loud, pushy, and aggressive, I will always be. So get used to it. Um, when we were established 23 years ago, Sunrise Cambodia existed only as a residential facility providing the best possible care for orphaned and vulnerable children. And this has now changed a bit. Although we will always have disabled, vulnerable and trafficked kids in our care, we are tackling um, the greater need in Cambodia for community-based development, which is now the focus of our work in all of our centres across the country. We have residential care for more than 200 children and open our doors to more than 3,000 children from local poor villages to uh, what we have at Sunrise. They learn English, computers, they have sport and music and early learning centres. Um, we're also renovating dilapidated schools, providing bicycles to allow children to get to school. And we've just built a bridge in a, in a village so that um, the population can get over it during the rainy season. They were cut off from going to school or to their jobs because the um, bridge was dangerous. Um, we um, are also uh, providing uh, wells and safe water in villages where there was no water at all and, and constructing livable homes for the destitute. My boyfriend that you saw in the video, um, he's be been given a house by us. His story is amazing. His name is Lau. He's 74. And um, during the Pol Pot times, the Khmer Rouge came to his village and rounded up all the men and took them to the forest. And what happens when you get taken to the forest, you will get killed. So he was in a lineup and they killed all the men before him. And when they got to him, they'd run out of ammunition. So he took up to the forest and survived um, just because they ran out of bullets. So it obviously it wasn't his time. Um, and in June this year, we opened um, a school and bathroom and laundry facilities for children who eke out a living on the dump, which you saw in that movie. So they can at least have some education and keep themselves clean. 
and the transformation of the communities we are supporting has been enormous and something I'm very proud of. As a result um, of a symposium I had here a couple of years ago, I managed to capture the imagination of a group of students from the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. God, that's a mouthful. Are they any of them here today? No? Yeah. Did you, did you come to the centre? Because, you know, he, um, this um, university brought 30 students um, to Sunrise and they paid all their own accommodation and airfares and they paid the cost to set up a hydroponic farm for us. Um, so, you guys, thank you. Thank you very much. What you've done has been wonderful. Um, we continue to have many other projects requiring funding in the areas of inf infrastructure, health and education. So if any of you might be interested in assisting us in ways to raise funding, include, inclu including me uh, speaking at your university, you just need to let me know. I'm happy to do that. Uh, I'm here today, so come up and talk to me. I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you think there's ways you can help me fundraise. Our vision is to break the poverty circle, cycle and transform lives. We are doing just that. Our core business, though, is in education. And Cambodia is so supporting UNICEF in its worldwide program to reintegrate children back into their families and communities if, if it's safe to do so. We continue, though, to pay for their education and we visit regularly and provide crisis care when required. We also enrol their parents and extended family members into vocational training programs and offer micro uh, loans to help them establish a business and improve their income and thereby raising the living standards of the entire family. In some cases, we repair houses and provide adequate sanitation. And this year, we've in reintegrated over 60 children. Um, it's uh, an ongoing project aimed at bringing children and what is left of their families closer and closer together. Most of these reintegrations have been successful, but not all. Um, some of the kids that have gone back, their parents have um, put them to work in the rice field or sent them to garment factories, um, taken away and sold their laptops that we gave them and their bikes. So um, it, these children can let us know their conditions. We go back and we bring them back to Sunrise. These programs can't always be 100% successful. Now, everything in life is about change. You heard about that recently. And family uni reunification is no exception. We have embraced this new way of thinking and we're working hard to achieve the goals for the world's vulnerable children set by UNICEF and the Cambodian government. We are highly respected by the Cambodians. Um, we're one of their most preferred um, orphanages. They come every year to do an investigation and they check us out from top to bottom, interview the kids. And for the last few years, we've been getting over 90% um, grades. And last year, we got 98%. So there's something we're doing right. Um, one of the most rewarding and exciting things I've ever done in my life was to get out of my comfort zone. Before I moved back to Cambodia, I had a very comfortable and privileged lifestyle. But all that changed. And I pity those who spend their whole lives being safe and comfortable, never knowing what it can really be and do. It's not until your back is truly against the wall that you know what you can achieve and who you are. Take it from me, try it. The mo most dangerous time of my life, I've got to tell you this one if I don't fall down again. Um, the most dangerous time of my life was um, in Cambodia in 1997 when there was um, a military coup and the royal family um, was forced to flee for their lives. And um, at that time, I was helping Princess Marie run her royal orphanage. And I had government plates on my car and I was working for the ex-prime minister who had been kicked out of the country. And I never really realised, sometimes we're in danger, you don't know that when you're actually in it. You only look back and you think, wow, I was in danger then. And at this time, after the three days of the violent killing and the, you know, the tanks in the street and everything, I, I was able to get back to the children in the orphanage. And we were under a terrible threat because the orphanage that we had back then was a previous military barracks, which I didn't know. And the soldiers wanted the barracks back. 
And then one day I was out there and this tank rode, rode through the gates with six soldiers on it. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> and um, the soldiers got off the tank and they were pointing AK-47s and B-40 rockets at the kids. Some of the kids are kneeling in the dust, praying, saying, don't kill us, don't kill us. Some of them were wetting themselves with fear. And my Khmer is not all that good, but when I'm really angry, my Khmer becomes really good. And some of these soldiers were only like 21, and I went up close to them and I said, does your mother know what you're doing here today? <laughs> and it was like going right over their heads. And then the commander looked at me really closely, put his gun down, nudged the soldier next to him, whispered to him. That soldier looked at me really closely. He put his gun down, whispered to the next one. And in a few minutes, they just all got on the tank and left. The kids and I went into the dining room. We're laughing and we're crying and we didn't know what had happened. And the older boys and the staff started to laugh. And I said, why are you laughing? And they said, oh, mum, it was your hair that saved us. <laughs> now, Cambodians are a delightful mix of people. Who, they're superstitious. They believe in ghosts and goblins and spells and witches and, and everything. And apparently, there's a very well-known witch in Cambodia that <laughs> wives go to when their husbands are unfaithful. And this, this witch punishes the, their husbands by turning their penises to the size of a pea. <laughs> and she's got bright red hair. <laughs> so the kids reckon nobody's got hair in Cambodia your colour, Mum, so we think the soldiers thought you might be that witch and they're not taking any chances. So when I uh, go home to Cambodia, I always make sure I've got plenty of hair colour in my suitcase. <laughs> um, I love telling that stories. Um, when I first took the group of vulnerable war orphans into my care, I had a crude idea of how the two children could attain the kind of personal wealth that I hold so dear. I gave them education, opportunity, infrastructure and security, but most of all, I gave them love. I gave them a roof to sleep under and I put them in school. I took them to the doctors when they were sick. I protected them and cared for them and filled them with love and respect and the belief that they could be whoever they wanted to be. I've been called many things, a humanitarian, a hero, a witch, <laughs> that pushy red-haired woman who always asks you for money, and some of these descriptions are a lot truer than others. I'll leave that to you to figure out. But something I am really called is flexible. Um, stubborn pig-headedness and tenacity has got me everything in life and gave me the strength to rescue the children from the border of Thailand and demand that they have a right to a life that is good, fair and filled with love. In the early years, I refused to use sponsors' money for public relations or a publicist. So I used to call corporations and trust funds and foundations and I'd say, hi, my name is Mandy Smith and I'm Geraldine Cox's publicist. If you're ever looking for a great speaker at your conference, then do consider her. You will not regret it. She's really something. <laughs> call, call me back on this number. And in many cases, they have called back and I answer the phone and they say, can we speak to Mandy Smith? And I say, Mandy's at lunch, it's Geraldine here. Um, can I help you? And I've got lots of gigs that way. And what I love about Mandy is that she's always there. She does what I tell her and she costs me nothing. <laughs> um, I am totally unqualified to do what I'm doing. I left school in grade nine. I didn't even finish the year. I have no university degree, I have no qualifications. If I wanted to do this kind of work in Australia, say in the Aboriginal community or something like that, and I went to the ministries, the departments, and they'd say, well, that's nice, Geraldine, but if you've got a teacher's degree, a social welfare, nursing perhaps, anything, and I don't, I don't have anything. But w when you become a parent, all you do is you shelter your kids, you feed them, you clothe them, you educate them, you keep them clean. 
You take care of their medical needs. You discipline them and you teach them the difference between right and wrong. You protect them, you comfort them, you wipe away their tears, you hug and you kiss them. You play with them, you make them laugh, you encourage them, you help fight their battles. You teach them to be compassionate and caring. You teach them to be kind to animals. You make them feel safe and secure. You support them. You find their talents and nurture them. You forgive them, you believe them, you teach them tolerance, you trust them, you guide them, and you tell them that they have a good future. You love them and you tell them that you will always be there for them. Now, where is the need for a university degree in all of that? If you remember anything I've said today, then remember this. Know that your greatest currency in life you will ever possess is how you affect others in the world. So please, always remember to be kind. Now, the Sunrise community knows I'm talking to you, and they've asked me to pass on to all of you their blessings. And I had a meeting with the kids and I said, look, I'm going to be talking to this big group. They, they might give us some money, they might not, um, but they'll certainly know about Sunrise. And I said, have you got a message for them? So the older kids got together and they came back, had a little meeting, gave me a piece of paper, and they said, this is what you have to say. So my kid asked me to say to you that they wish you long life, health, strength, wisdom, and what we all need most in the world, they wish you peace. And I looked at this list and I said, hang on. I said, wealth's not on that list. And one of my teenagers stood up and rolled his eyes and he said, Mum, if you've got long life, health, strength, wisdom and peace, you're already rich. You should know that. So what I love about my life in Cambodia, it's not so much what I do for the children, it's what they do for me and what they give back to me. So thank you very much for listening to me and I'm hoping to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you. My name is James Tran and I am on a mission to remind the world and all its people to love and serve one another. So Miss Geraldine, there is no doubt that you possess a wealth of experience, expertise, insight and life advice. Keep going. So my question to you, <laughs> my kind lady, mm -hmm. is if you could visit your 21 year old self, what would your number one advice be? And what would your number one advice be to all of us emerging young leaders in the world <laughs> as we embark on our quest to change the world because I refuse for my children and my generations to live and grow up in a world where these sort of things, all the things that's happening in Cambodia, well, exist. Well, you should be a priest or a... a, a <laughs> you should have a following in a church, right. You're having a really good time enjoy that time my advice to you is that this is the most powerful time of your life don't waste it take advantage of it and make it work for you and help other people through it thank you thank okay. you for your question thank you thank you okay my name is julia i'm a chemical engineering student from where Canada. where where are you i just today. i'm right here okay yeah right here yeah uh, I'm studying chemical engineering at McGill University. I have a question about how you mentioned that you can't waste your time worrying about things you simply cannot change in regards to um, when the men are raping the children with disabilities. Um, I have a question, what is your advice for our generation where almost every issue seems out of reach? Not to give up. Uh, there have been people in the world that um, have ne never become famous, like Mandela and so on, who really changed the world. But you don't have to be famous to change the world. You have to believe in what it is you want to change, and you have to find ways to go about that change. But don't give up. Don't take no for an answer. I never take no for an answer. And don't be overwhelmed by the size of the problem. Um, chip away at it because you will have an effect. It may, may take time, but not doing anything is not the answer. Hello, my name's Justin from Western Sydney University. Um, we've heard several examples over the last few days um, of many socially and financially disadvantaged communities from all over the world that are um, often keen to accept financial help 
um, but they don't want to better themselves or take steps towards making their communities self-sustaining. Uh, how do you change this mindset in Cambodia and how do you encourage people and motivate people to want to take care of themselves and their communities? One of the biggest problems in Cambodia is that we're 90% um, reliant on foreign aid. That's because of the war, Pol Pot, um, the lack of education for many years, and 90% of the income is driven by um, uh, foreign aid. And this is starting to create a feeling of dependence and entitlement um, on, the, on the people. Um, I don't quite know how to stop that feeling of dependence. Um, we've got it a little bit like that in Australia with you know, Centrelink mm -hmm. and all of that, and Britain has three generations of people that have never worked. Um, and the way I bring up the children, I, I tell them it's okay to accept something, but give it back, pay it back. If somebody helps you financially or in any other way, find a way to help somebody else to make that giving um, worthwhile. But it's going to take time in a country like Cambodia. The rich never give to anybody in Cambodia. Um, it's part of that Buddhist... Um, belief that if you're having a hard life in this one, it's because you're getting karma for shit you did before. So trying to compete with that, it can be often difficult. But I'm trying to change it in my own little way with my kids. How do you believe that developed nations have a moral responsibility to help nations like Cambodia? Absolutely. How do you think we go about attaining the ideal of a global community and having compassion for others outside of our own nations? The second part of the question is um, you're never going to solve that problem because there are people that will never give. Um, but people in the de developed world need to hear things like we've all spoken about today. They, they need it shoved in their face for them to know how lucky they are, especially in Australia. I mean, we have everything. Um, you will reap the rewards of giving back. Even as a government, um, I, I don't think um, any developed country in the world should not accept the responsibility to make life better for others. Um, but not all countries feel that way. Good morning, everyone. I'm a Chinese student from Hebei University. And first of all, I will very enjoy your speech and I will feel very great honored. Uh, and you know, our city, Hefei and uh, Phnom Penh are friendly city. And uh, every year we have about 60 uh, students from Cambodia to study in our university. So I feel very honored to talk with you. One of my kids is studying in China now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my question is about uh, Chinese poverty uh, problem. Um, our Chinese government will monitor and evaluate the poor area people. And I have attended this activity for about three years. And uh, the situation is that every time when I evaluate and when I research these poor area uh, people, I will, I will meet and encounter uh, such a person. They will say to me how tough, how difficult, and how poverty my life. But the truth is that they were subsidized by our government and they were already reach the uh, level about, uh, of clothing and food. They want to grab more resources which belong to the truly poor people. So I, my question is that when you encounter these people, how do you deal with it and how to solve this problem? Thank you. Okay, in, in a small way, um, we reach out to people in the, in the poor communities we offer them uh, micro loans to open up small businesses. Could, could, could be just um, an ice cream cart, or it could be um, a food stall in the market. And we try and teach them uh, how good it feels to make money. But also, you have to work to make money. Um, so giving that kind of opportunity to the poor, you can't just hand them something. You've got to make them work for and make them feel that they are achieving something for themselves. You're not just giving them a handout. So make those poor people work to make their lives better. I know it sounds harsh, but it's one way of doing it. Um, my name is Deko Awel. I am from Kenya University called United States International University of Africa. Um, my question is, what made you choose Cambodia as a country that you wanted to work with for the rest of your life? I didn't choose it, it chose me. Um, 
I had no idea at the age of 25 when I was sent there during the war that it was going to change my life, and it has changed my life, but I didn't choose it. I'd never heard of it. In fact, when I was in Foreign Affairs and they called me to my postings meeting where they were going to tell me um, where I was going, and they said, we've selected you to go to Phnom Penh. And um, it's pronounced Phnom Penh, but she said it as Phnom Penh. So when I went out, I got the atlas out to look under N for Phnom Penh, couldn't bloody find it because I didn't even know how to spell it. So I, I, I didn't choose the place. Yeah, and I'm so glad it chose me. Um, hi, my name's Shabel. I'm representing Western Sydney University. Right. My question for you is, from your experience, what advice would you give young leaders to help us discover our passions early on? Not to be afraid of what it is you think you want to do. Sometime when you're young, you think, oh, I'd love to be that or I'd love to do that, but no, I'm not good enough, or no, no, it would be too hard. So not to be afraid to do the things you don't think you can do. Um, because most of us can do the things that we want to do, but some of us are just too afraid to try. So don't be afraid. Whatever it is that you want that feel is out of your bounds, just don't accept that. Work towards it. Don't give up. Yesterday we had a question that wasn't quite answered in the manner I believe was intended about volunteerism, that whole uh, taking on as many opportunities overseas as you can despite the effects that your short-term contribution has to the community, detrimental as it may be. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong if you have an issue with this as well, the fact that people are just trying to pad their resumes with such uh, activities. Um, and I think this comes from a distinct lack of self-awareness that we have, that we don't actually realise how this is affecting other people and how our actions are affecting other people. So my question is, how do we bring uh, this necessary self-awareness, this reflexivity and this introspection to the community, and pardon my Australian, but without appearing to be intellectual tosspots? Yeah, you're right. Some people just want to put volunteering at orphanages in Cambodia on their CVs. And that's one of the reasons we don't take volunteers. Um, we only take people that are really, really qualified in uh, teaching English as a second language, for instance. But <clears throat> I get so many people that want to come and volunteer and be with the kiddies, OK? Um, and that can often be more damaging than um, uh, anything I could possibly imagine. Um, so volunteering should be from the right perspective. Um, go to websites, um, find organisations that um, have credibility, that have um, a website, that have um, state their financial um, reports on, on, the, on, the, um, on their websites. Um, don't be taken in by ones that will say, oh, we can find you a terrific job but it will cost you $2,000 to register with us. They're crooks. Um, but you really need to research the places you want to go to and not just choose something out of the hat. Um, there are plenty of places that really do take volunteers and take them seriously, but it's up to you to find the right place to go to. Um, and don't do it without doing a lot of research before you do it. Well, only sign yourself up for something you're really qualified to do. Don't go with just good intentions. Go in knowing what it is and how it is you can make a difference. So do your research. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Lavanya Karthike. I'm from India. So in India, we have a lot of poverty, and we have many youth uh, who are not having their education, their primary education. So my question to you is that, what would we do as the youth of India or the country? How do we help who, do, who are not accepting of this kind of help, who, who are not accepting to rise from their poverty, who are not accepting education? What do we do about this, ma'am? That's a pretty unanswerable question. I've been to India. I know what you're talking about. And, you know, there's people that are born and die on the streets there and never, ever have a chance in life. I really can't answer your question. If I could, I'd be there doing it. And if you knew the answer to that, you'd be doing it too. But um, some people just have bad luck in life. And it's as simple as that. I'm really sorry I don't have an answer for your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, introduction brief. Um, good morning, uh, Ms. Judy. My name is Simon Shaheen. I'm, I'm a former refugee from Syria, but I'm coming from Australia. Now, first of all, 
can I take the title of Margaret Thatcher and give it to you, be an Iron Woman? And uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for these amazing stories that you shared us. Actually, it made me tear in every single one of them. And I know that what you were, you were saying, where you come from, in fact, the solution starts locally. And it is true, we should share your sto the stories that you've been carrying on, especially for foundations like the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. that can eradicate Sorry, thank you. Can you this. please just get to the Exactly. Question? My point is this, is this, and also thanks very much for all these feelings that we carry on. My point is, is that how can you think, what do you think from your perspective we can do as students from, uh, from you know, different disciplines and uh, those who are passionate about human rights advocacy, what can we do from our perspective not only in, caring, uh, in helping your organization, but also all of Southeast Asia and other places that are having those uh, trends and phenomena. Thank you very much. Um, if I had my time over again, I would um, be educated to the point where I could apply for jobs with people like um, uh, Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International. Um, what you need to do in this room is to find organizations that you can use your education and your degrees in where you can really make a difference. Sorry if I can't answer your question better than that. It's okay? Yeah. Hello, my name is Prateek. I'm from India. Uh, my question is, have you experienced any significant um, pushback or like attempts at stopping what you're trying to do in Cambodia from the government or from big powers in the country? And if so, how have you dealt with that? Um, I'm really lucky. The answer to that is that, that um, after the coup and after all the uh, problems that I had, um, I reached out to Hun Sen, um, who is still the leader and has just run the, the last elections. He doesn't have a really good reputation internationally, but basically he does want to do the best for Cambodian people. And when I went to him with my story and I took a whole bunch of my kids there to plead for land and for help, he... Um, it's truly supportive of my project. He's given me land, free hand, a free title land for my centre. Um, and in many ways, in fact, this Sunday, uh, the government is sending 30 dentists out to the orphanage with their um, machinery and their dentist chairs and everything and giving all the kids and the staff um, uh, cleaning um, extractions and um, fillings. So um, Sunrise is really known and supported by the Cambodian government and we have not re received any pushback at all. But they don't give money. Um, governments in Cambodia get aid from Australia and other parts of the world, but it's government to government, like the Australian, uh, Australian aid gives to the Cambodian government. It doesn't filter down to projects like mine. But the government does help me a lot in, in other ways, in goods in kind. Uh, they often send rice and that to us, so um, we are lucky to be approved and um, by the, by the local government. It makes a big difference to my life, knowing that I'm protected like that. Thanks. Um, I'm Tiger, I'm from Sydney, Australia. I'm from a predominantly Vietnamese and Cambodian uh, community. So your work really hit, uh, hits home for me. And um, I was just curious to know, um, what was it like transitioning out of the office space and into sort of, start, like um, into the work that you're in now? And what uh, were some of the challenges that you faced with setting up Sunrise? It was really hard because when I lived in in Cambodia in the 70s, I had everything. Uh, you know, like, as I said, maids, chauffeur-driven cars, all of that sort of thing. But when I went back, when I was 50, um, I was just a foreign lady on the streets. I had no protection. I rented a room with um, uh, no uh, fan or air conditioning. Um, I ate locally in the markets, which I still do because I love it. Um, but. I was not protected in the way that I had been under the diplomatic umbrella. And that's what I talk, talk about getting out of your comfort zone. When I first got there and realised it wasn't going to be like it was in the 70s and that I was basically on my own um, and getting out of my comfort zone was a very valuable thing, but it was not easy. Um, again, life is about change and I had to accept that things had changed since I'd been there in the 70s, and if I didn't accept it and run with it, I was never going to be a success, but it was hard. Um, I re remember um, one of the, the, the place that I'm talking about where I rented a room, and there were 16 other people who had rooms, and there was just one bathroom and toilet, and you had to line up in the morning to use to have a shower. And I used to take a tin with me and stand in the tin because everybody had blown their nose and horrible, other horrible stuff into the shower uh, floor. 
So I carried a tin in so that I didn't have to stand in everybody else's stuff. It was that bad. And then one day I had diarrhoea and there was no way I could, I could wait to go to the toilet. So I grabbed a plastic bag and went into my room and relieved myself in the plastic bag, not knowing there were holes in the bottom of it and everything ran through the, <laughs> the floor into the room below. So, you know, I, I had to go from a life of materialism into using a, a plastic bag to urinate. So, you know, it's and, been um, hard. In, in such an environment, how did you go about setting up our sunrise? Well, I just saw the need and um, I was able to get people to give me money and that's a real gift. So when I got that money, that's when I had 24, 24 children when I first started up on the border. So I went back to Australia and I said, how hard can it be to give me money for 24 kids? Um, and it's just grown fr from that. But I've used my, my talent into talking people into give me, giving me money uh, that's made my um, charity successful. But it gets harder and harder. There are 60,000 charities in Australia. I'm just one. So I, I do find the competing with other good charities um, very challenging. Um, uh, the question that I wanted to ask is that um, what helps you to always be focused on making an impact and not allow yourself to be distracted by the changes around you and in your own personal life? And is, is, do you actually meditate or do you have a specific way of training your mind to always be focused on what you uh, want to, yeah. you know? To um, focus on. I try not to get distracted because every day I see things that break my heart um, and I have to turn myself off to a certain degree. Um, I have tried meditation but I'm so distracted with all the kids around me that it's pretty difficult. I want to sign up to do a Vipassana course which is a meditation course in the Blue Mountains when I've got t 10 days that I can take off. Um, how to motivate myself to do what I'm doing is I just have to look at the kids around me and see what they don't have and what they could have if I'm successful. So I feel uh, a real necessity to be successful. If I'm not, I'm failing the kids. So that's motivation enough. I just have to look at their faces every day and I say, you've got to go out there and do that. Um, I wish meditation worked for me, but it, it hasn't so far. Again, the old gin and tonics are a good replacement. Mm-hmm. <laughs>